mean, if you strip it down, there is no theory in valuation. It's the simplest of all exercises. To, va to put a number on something, you can do one of two things. You can estimate the cash flows you will get from owning the business, or you can look at what other people are paying for similar businesses. That's it. Now, you can add layers of detail to it, but I start there and then I say, look, I know for the moment you're saying, how do I come up with these cash flows and how do I adjust for risk and time? But those are details. It's really that big picture perspective that guides us all the way through the class. So start with basics and then build up. You make it sound so simple, but yeah. it is, it's certainly the hardest part of investing, I think. And no, no, I, I think you're mistaking life for investing. Life is hard. Forecasting <laughs> the future is hard, right? Now, what I'm trying to say is the mechanics of investing are easy. What people run into is predicting, forecasting the future, and they assume that that's because they don't know valuation. Mm. You sit down to value NVIDIA. Your biggest challenge is not knowing, is, is not that you don't know how to estimate cash flows or discount rates. That's easy enough to do. None of us knows how AI will play out and what it will show up as NVIDIA selling more AI chips. So we need to separate out how much of this is you're not understanding valuation and how much of this is you not wanting to grapple with the fact that the future is uncertain and more uncertain in some businesses than others. And that's going to show up in your valuation. Yeah, I like that. That might be the title of the episode. Investing is easy, life is hard. <laughs> <laughs> so when when um, it comes to this valuation work, there's a few concepts that uh, have become synonymous with your work and that you've, you've written books on and spent a lot of time on and would love you to explain them and, and help us understand them. And uh, when we were preparing for this interview, we thought the, good, the right starting point for this was understanding the difference between price and value. I, I ask people to think about how much they pay for an apartment or a house they've bought recently. And for many Americans, that's getting out of, uh, out of reach. But when you think about how much you pay for a house or apartment, you don't do an intrinsic valuation. You basically decide how much to pay based on what other people are paying for similar houses. That's pricing. You're essentially looking at what other people are paying. And in, in, in a way, most of our lives is spent by looking at what crowds do. I mean, I don't know about you, but I decide what to watch on Netflix by checking out Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. I check, you know, decide where to eat by checking out Yelp. Think of markets as essentially the crowd judgment and what companies are worth. And you try to use that crowd judgment. And that's what pricing does. You're trusting the crowd on average to get it right. You're saying individually crowds might make mistakes on companies, but collectively they're usually right. In valuation, you approach it differently. You don't think about buying something because everybody else is buying it. You buy it because you're interested in it as a business. You're buying it as a business. And when you buy it as a business, I don't care what other people think about your business, that it's glorious or awful. Ultimately, it's cash in, cash out. You can't get away from that. So when you think about an asset as a business, you've got to understand the business. You have to understand what drives its growth and its profitability and its risk and bring them all into an assessment of value. Now, we might call this a discounted cash flow valuation, but remember, valuation predates discounted cash flow valuation. Discounted cash flow valuation is a tool that has been developed primarily in the last 87 years, 1937. John Williams' book was the first one, one that described the mechanics of discounted cash flow valuation. But I think of intrinsic valuation as predating discounted cash flow valuation. The Venetian glassmaker in the 1500s who decided how much to pay for a business based it on cash flows, growth, and risk. It's as old as time, but it is more work because you have to understand the business to be able to value it. So given a choice in valuing something and pricing something, most people, including most people who claim to do valuation, are really doing pricing. Mm, nice. Yeah, it is. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've read some of your writings about how people will claim they're doing valuation work when they do you know, look at price to earnings or look at price to earnings relative to other peers in their field. Uh, but that's not really valuation work. That's a pricing exercise. But but you know why they do it? Because we train people to believe that pricing is shallow and valuation is deep. That you all, we all want to be Warren Buffett. We don't <laughs> want to be somebody who picks stocks based on what other people are paying. So they get that message, which is even if you're doing pricing, you got to masquerade as if you're doing valuation. And this is especially true if you're a professional money manager, right? You have to create that facade of, I think about cash flows, growth and risk, when all you're thinking about is momentum, mood and what's everybody else buying. Now, I, I, I tell people, look, 
if we're more, if we could all be better investors, we were all more honest with ourselves about what we're doing. There is nothing worse in investing than to trade and act like you're an investor or vice versa, invest and adopt trading. Trading is what prices do. Investing is what people who use value do. There's nothing better or worse about one versus the other. But most people who claim to be investors are really trading. They buy low, sell high. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's effectively just as, a, you know, as good a way to make money as investing. It's just a different way. Mm. Now, related to this concept of price and value is uh, numbers and narrative, and you literally wrote the book on this. Uh, and it, uh, so, I guess, can you talk us through uh, numbers and narrative, and I guess how they fit together when you're doing a valuation exercise? I can tell you where that book was born. It was born from looking at a couple of things out there that seem to be in direct contradiction of each other. Here's the first: we have far more data today than we did 40 years ago when we sit down to value companies. I'm old enough to remember using an annual report, a physical annual report, and doing a valuation with a pencil on a ledger sheet, right? Minimal tools, very little data. We have far more data than we ever did, and we have far more powerful models than we ever did. And here was the contradiction. I was noticing that the quality of valuations was actually getting worse rather than better because you know, it, it, you'd think that with all this data, all these tools, you'd, you'd be getting more sophisticated, better valuations. So I started thinking about why is that happening? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that people are not valuing companies anymore. They're doing financial modeling. To them, valuation is an Excel spreadsheet. You change the numbers, you project the numbers out, you use some neat little functions, you build some macros, maybe even bring Python into the mix. It's become the mechanics of the process and people have lost sight of the fact that the numbers are essentially a reflection of a story you're telling about a business. And because it's so easy to grind out the numbers, 40 years ago, you had no choice but to tell the story because your numbers were limited. You had to tell people, this is why I think Coca-Cola is a great company going into the 1980s. It's a US company that's poised to go globally. And therefore, I think it is going to grow faster. And because it spun off its bottlers, it doesn't make the actual product, its margins can be high. And then you put the numbers on paper because there weren't that many numbers. Today, what do you have? You have a 20 year projection of growth and margins. And people have forgotten that those numbers don't come out of nowhere. Every number tells a story, whether you want to or not. Like one of the exercises I do in my class, I give them an Excel spreadsheet, a banking valuation. Banking valuations are not valuations, they're just financial models. I give them the spreadsheet and said, tell me what the implicit story is in these numbers and tell me whether you think a company like the one described in this model can actually exist. So the narrative in numbers was really about filling in that space where people had lost connection to the numbers. The models were running analysts rather than the other way around. Yeah, I love that. And um, uh, we certainly see, you know, I think you, you use the example in your book about uh, a company like Uber, which, you know, was reaching billions of dollars in valuation without, you know, making a making a profit. And you sort of see how valuation is often driven by narrative. And, and I guess, you know, the AI boom that we're living uh, through now. I mean, is, let, me, let me back that up. It's not that valuations are driven by narrative. It depends on where you catch a company. Uber in 2013, there was not much history. There wasn't really a company. It was all potential. Your entire value comes from the story. There are no numbers. So you're going to look at historical numbers and try to project them. God help you. There aren't any. (laughs) In contrast, if you ask me to value Coca-Cola today, I could do a valuation entirely with the numbers. Now, the way I describe it is when you're valuing a young company, it's like being called in to finish a book where the authors died and they want you to complete the book. So the young company, you're called in a chapter two of the book saying, you know what, there are 33 more chapters in the book and you complete the book. And guess what? The range of stories you can tell is huge because the story is still getting formed. In contrast, if I call you in chapter 33 of a 35 chapter book, you don't have much room to run. So when you value Coca-Cola, there aren't that many divergent stories you can tell about where Coca-Cola is going. Its story has been pretty much told. 